Solving quadratics equations by factoring. When we have a quadratic equation and we want to solve by factoring, we're going to be using the zero product property. And what that states is if you have a times b and it equals zero, then either the a factor is zero or the b factor is zero or both are equal to zero. So just so we can see what this means, if I have 3 times x and it equals 0, well, my 3 isn't the 0, so x must be 0. Now, we could always go back to solving equations, and when we solve equa equations, we want to solve for the variable or isolate the variable. So in this case, in order to isolate the variable, I would need to do the inverse operation of division. So I would divide both sides by 3, and I would get the solution that x equals 0. But using the 0 property gives me the fact that if I'm multiplying something to a number and it equals 0, then one of the numbers are 0 or both are. So we're going to be using this property to solve quadratics by factoring. So when you're solving quadratics by factoring, the first rule is you have to have your quadratic equation in standard form. And standard form is you want to set your equation up from the highest exponent to the constant and it has to be equal to zero. So if it's not in standard form, you need to move things around to get it in standard form. Once it's in standard form, you can factor the quadratic. So you can factor into the two binomials or if it's just a GCF, but you're going to factor your trinomial and in this case we get two binomials and then you'll take each factor separately and set them equal to zero. So you're going to take each factor separately and set them equal to zero and then you'll have two equations to solve. So let's see what this looks like. So here's an example. We have x squared minus x minus 6 equals 0. I want to solve for x, and I'm going to solve by factoring. So the first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to check, is it in standard form? And yes, it's in standard form. It's x squared down to the constant, and it equals 0. So now what I'm going to do is factor. So remember when you're factoring trinomials, you always want factors of the constant, which is this negative 6, that will add up to the coefficient of x, which is negative 1. So factors of a negative 6 that add up or subtract to a negative 1 is a negative 3 and positive 2. So I factor it into the two binomials, x minus 3 times x plus 2 equals 0. And now I can set each factor equal to 0. So I set each factor equal to 0, and I solve for x. And when I solve for x here, I end up getting 3 and negative 2. Because when I have x minus 3 equals 0 and I solve for x, I'm going to add 3 to both sides, and I get 3. For the x plus 2 equals 0, I subtract 2 from both sides, and I get a negative 2. So these are my solutions for this quadratic equation. So here's another example. Now the first thing I'm checking, is it in standard form? And it is in standard form because it's going from the highest exponent down to the, the, in this case, there's no constant, so it's going to the lowest exponent, and it equals 0. Now, in this case, because there's no constant, then it's just a GCF. So I'm going to be factoring out the greatest common factor from this so that I can use factoring to solve. So when I factor out the GCF, in this case, is 5x, I end up with 5x times x minus 2 equals 0. Now I take each factor and set it equal to 0. And one of my factors is that 5x. So 5x equals 0, and then the x minus 2 equals 0. For the 5x equals 0, well, we showed with the 0 property, well, my x value equals 0. And then the x minus 2, when I solve for x, I add 2 to both sides. So my other solution would be positive 2. So the solutions here would be 0, positive 2. Pause and try. 
So it checks out. It's in standard form. I factor. I get x minus 14, x minus 2. I set each factor equal to 0, and I solve. So my solutions here, I'll get x equals a positive 14 and a positive 2. Pause and try. So I'm going to factor here, and the factor here is just a GCF because there's no constant. And I said each factor equal to 0. And if I have x squared equals 0, then x must equal 0. And then when I solve for x minus 1 equals 0, I get x equals a positive 1. So my solutions here are 0, positive 1. So now here is a quadratic equation, and we're asked to solve but it's not in standard form. When it's not in standard form, we need to get it in standard form. And that means we have to move things from one side of the equal sign to the other. So here's a key note. You always want to move to the highest exponent. So in this case, I see that x squared is on the right-hand side. So that means I want to move that 3x and that minus 6 all over to the right-hand side. So here I move, to get it in standard form, I'm going to first move that positive 3x, and the positive 3x, to move it, I have to do the opposite, so I subtract 3x from both sides. Now notice when I do this, I can't combine that 3x with that x squared because they're not like terms, or I can't combine it with that minus 10 because they're not like terms, and I want it in standard form, so I'm going to put it in the middle. So I end up having x squared minus 3x minus 10. Now it's still not in standard form because it doesn't equal 0, so I have to move that minus 6 over. And to move a minus 6 over, I have to do the opposite, with the, which is addition, or add 6 to both sides. And I'm going to add it to the like term, which is the constant, that minus 10. So now I have my quadratic in standard form. It's 0 equals x squared minus 3x minus 4. Now that it's in standard form, I can factor. And I'm going to factor, and it's going to end up being x minus 4, x plus 1. And I'm going to take each factor and set it equal to 0 and solve. So I get x equals 4, and x equals a negative 1. I want to do one more example here, because it's not a simple quadratic, because I have a cube in the equation. Whenever you have a cube or any higher exponent, you always want to get it in standard form by moving to the highest exponent. And because the highest exponent here is that cube, or the third power, I want to move that 15x over to the left-hand side. Because it's a positive 15x, I'm going to subtract it from both sides. And now I have it in standard form. Highest exponent down to the constant, but in this case we have it down to the variable x. Now, the first thing you're going to need to do here is factor out the GCF. And in this case, the GCF is simply x. So when you factor it out of each term, you're left with x times x squared plus 2x minus 15. Now you have a quadratic that can be factored. So you're going to factor the quadratic, and when you factor it, don't forget to bring the GCF down with your factors. You cannot forget your GCF. It's part of your solution. Now you're going to take each factor and set it equal to 0. And that GCF x has to be set equal to 0 also. So you're going to have three solutions here. You're going to have that x equals 0. You're going to have that x equals a positive 3. And you're going to have x equals a negative 5. So don't forget to set your GCF as a solution or equal to 0 to find the solution. Pause and try. So the first thing you're doing is getting it in standard form. So you had to add 20 to both sides. And now you factor. You should have gotten factors of x plus 4, x plus 5. And you set each factor equal to 0, and you sob. So your solutions here would be x equals a negative 4 and negative 5. Pause and try. 
So here you see we have x to the third, so we want to move everything over to the left-hand side. So I'm going to first add the 3x squared, and then I'm going to subtract the 10x over, and now I'm going to factor. I'm going to factor out the GCF, which is an x, and I have my quadratic, and now I'm going to factor that into two binomials. So we get x, parentheses, x minus 2, parentheses, x plus 5. Take each factor here and set it equal to 0, and your solutions will be x equals 0, x equals a positive 2, and x equals a negative 5. So now we're going to talk about simplifying radicals. When we simplify radicals, we are, we're square roots is the inverse of a square. So when we talk about what a radical is, the radical is the symbol for the square root. And what's inside, the value that's inside, is called the radicand. So the square root symbol is called a radical. So when we're simplifying radicals, that's what we're talking about. So to simplify radicals, we're going to use this product property of radicals. And what this product property states is, is if you have a number under the radical, you can break it out into factors, leaving them both under the radical. And it still means the same thing. So when we talk about simplifying a radical, what you're going to do is you're going to find a perfect square factor, and you want it to be the highest perfect square factor, and you're going to find the factor that's going to be left under. If un what's under the radical is not a perfect square and doesn't come out as a whole number, when you're asked to simplify a radical, you're going to have to simplify a piece, and it, that piece is going to be the highest perfect square factor. So now when we talk about for perfect squares, we can come up with a list easily by doing it in numerical order. Meaning, when it, we're looking for perfect squares, perfect squares are the num a number multiplied to itself. And what you get from that is a perfect square. So if I were to do the list of perfect squares, I would do it in numerical order and I get 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, 36, 49, and so on. And where this list is coming from is 1 times 1 is 1, 2 times 2 is 4, or 3 squared, which is 3 times 3 is 9, 4 times 4 is 16. So I'm just mentally doing the squaring in numerical order so I have my list of perfect squares. Now, if we had a perfect square under the radical, it would simplify to a whole number. If we do not, we're going to have to simplify the radical. Now, I kind of want to take a step back so you understand when you simplify a radical, it has to be in simplest form. Very similar to reducing a fraction. So this is just a little side note. If you have to reduce a fraction, and this is going back, when you reduce a fraction, it always has to be in simplest form. So if I take 8 over 25 and reduce it to 4 over 12, it's not in simplest form, therefore it's not correct. I would have to keep on reducing in order to have it in simplest form. So this is similar to simplifying fractions that if you simplify a radical, you have to have it in simplest radical form. So let's do an example. So here's an example where I have the square root of 72 and I'm asked to simplify the radical. Well, to simplify the radical, the first thing I'm checking is what's under the radical a perfect square. So I look at my list here and I have 4, 9, 16, and again, I told you how it was created. I look and I see is 72 in the list and it's not. So 72 is not a perfect square. So I need to take out the perfect square factor and find out what factor multiplied to it is going to be the leftover. And I like to start high with my perfect squares because I need to simplify it in simplest radical form. So I need to pull out the highest perfect square factor. So when I go down the list, I'm starting with the highest one. And I'm going to start with, when I look at it, I know that 49 is not going to divide into 72. So I'm looking at the next one, which is 36. 
So 36 divides into 72, so I can break it out into those factors where I have 36, which is my perfect square factor, and the factor 2, which is my leftover. Now all I did here was I took 72 and I broke it out into factors. 36 times 2 equals 72. But now I can simplify a piece of this radical. I can simplify the perfect square piece. So the square root of 36 will come out as a whole number 6, and I will just attach it to the leftover factor square root of 2. So this is what a simplified radical looks like. So the square root of 72 would simplify to 6 radical 2. Now I want to show you the same exact example, but say I was looking at this and I thought, well, 9 divides into it and 9 is a perfect square. And I chose to simplify it using the square root of 9 times the square root of 8. 9 times 8 is 72. The 9 is a perfect square and it's going to simplify. And I simplify the 9 and I end up getting 3 radical 8. But what I want you to notice here is that my leftover piece, that radical 8, has a perfect square in it. Therefore, I did not simplify it completely. So if I don't simplify it completely, it's going to be wrong. So I'm going to need to also continue to simplify. So I take that radical 8. That radical 8 has a perfect square of 4 in it and my leftover of 2. And then I would simplify the 4, the square root of 4, and it would become the square root of uh, uh, 2. And then I multiply that 3 to that 2 that's on the outside, and you see we get the same answer, 6 radical 2. This would be in simplest radical form. So remember to look at your leftover radical and see if there's any perfect square factors in it. If there is, then you did not factor out the highest perfect square factor. So be careful when you're simplifying radicals. Pause and try. So in this case, we see that our perfect square factor is 4, my leftover is 3, and I simplify the perfect square piece and I end up getting 2 radical 3. So be careful here because, again, you might think, well, 6 times 2 equals 12, so I can break it out into factors of 6 and 2, but neither one are, the, are perfect squares, therefore it won't simplify. So that won't work. So you always have to think of what is the highest perfect square factor and factor that out so you can simplify a piece of the radical. Pause and try. So my highest perfect square factor is 16, my leftover is 2, I simplify the square root of 16, and I get 4 root 2. So you don't keep on simplifying. Once it's simplified, you're done.